By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have reached the top eight of the Camel Trophy, the old school magic gentleman's tournament held in Arnhem, the Netherlands. And in the top eight, we are going to see a fan favorite returning to the channel. We have Peter's Enchantress deck that is doing ridiculously good at this tournament. If you haven't seen it in action, please check out the description below for a link to the playlist. And in that playlist, you can see a lot of episodes with the Enchantress deck. And the Enchantress deck is taking on a zoo deck that's being piloted by Gideon. And both of these decks play with Channel Fireball. So we've seen Channel Fireball already in action quite a few times from Peter's deck. But who knows, maybe Gideon here can win it with a Channel Fireball as well. We just have to wait and see. Now, before I dive into the deck deck section of this deck, I've got beautiful deck photos of both of these decks. I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also skip, uh, choose to skip that section of the video. First, go to the games. I know some of you prefer to do that. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below because there you'll find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and it'll take you straight to the action. As for now, I'm going to continue with the deck decks and I'm going to start with the deck of Peter. And here we see the deck of Peter. So this is for Jern Enchantress, right? Combined with mainly blue, we also see a little bit of red. And even in the sideboard, we see some white. So that's quite interesting. Let's first kind of focus on what he wants to do here. So for Jern Enchantress, two green and one to cast for an O2 beautiful creature, beautiful art. Uh, but it also has a useful ability because when you cast an enchantment, you get to draw a card, which is quite nice. So if you play, for example, your Sylvan Library, you get to draw a card. Talking about Sylvan Library, it's a card that goes together quite well with your Enchantress because it allows you to look at the top three cards, put them in order. So that means that you're going to put an enchantment on top, draw the enchantment, play the enchantment, draw another card. And the more cards you draw, of course, the better the Sylvan gets because then next turn, you probably get to see three completely new cards. Again, you're going to put those enchantments at the top and kind of create your own drawing engine. Now, this card uh, goes together quite well with another enchantment here, Dark Heart of the Wood. Dark Heart of the Wood, one green and one black, a card from the dark. If you sacrifice a forest, you gain three life. Now, this is really a control deck, right? You want to get your card draw engine going. You know, you want to draw into your burn spells. You want to start copying your Fudurian Enchantress. You want to do all these shenanigans. That means you need time. Life gain equals time, right? So if Peter can find his Dark Heart of the Wood quite early in the game in combination with an Enchantress, he can start sacking forests, drawing cards, gain some life, you know. And I think then he's in a good position. If he cannot, you know, then it's going to get difficult for him. What I also like in this deck is that he is playing Channel Fireball. But what he can also do is he can use his channel to just gain a lot of, just hurt himself basically, lose a lot of life. Why would you want to do that? Because he's also playing Mirror Universe. So let's say he's in a situation where he's got a Brain Geyser and a channel. He could kind of draw a lot of cards, hurt himself a lot, and then next turn use his Mirror Universe and change life totals. Like that would be an ideal scenario for him. That would be really funny if you could pull that off. Um, and then in the sideboard, which is quite interesting, he is playing with some white card. So he's playing Circle of Protection, red, which of course is a problem for him. Like this deck, if it has to deal with an earthquake, that's going to be disastrous. And of course, an aggressive red deck, like a lot of burn, that's going to be quite hard for Peter to uh, to handle with. He really wants to go that control route. So I get it that he put a Circle of Protection, red there, and also a Circle of Protection, black against, uh, I guess, against the, uh, the aggro black decks as well. And because you've got access to City of Brass and you've got access to four Birds of Paradise, there could be a scenario where you're able to kind of, you know, get white mana and play these cards because they only have white, one white in their casting cost anyway. So, you know, overall, I think Peter's deck is um, it's really funny. It's looking good. It's looking okay. And uh, I, I, I always look forward to seeing Enchantress because you don't see it that often. Okay, enough about Enchantress. Now let's take a look at the zoo deck of his opponent, Gideon. And here we see the zoo deck of Gideon. And I know Gideon quite well. He's part of the Amsterdam uh, play group that I'm also a part of. We both live in Amsterdam. And uh, I know what he likes, you know. And this is really a deck that's close to his heart, you know. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gideon. But I think what you enjoy doing most is just slamming big creatures on the table and turn them sideways. Or in case of Sarah Angel, not even turning them sideways, but really win through combat damage. And of course, you like good cards. So he usually plays... 
with the power cards, with the restricted cards. We see all those in here. Um, he's, of course, also playing with white, giving you that, you know, easy way to get rid of, uh, of permanents, creatures, enchantments, well, actually artifacts, because he's playing disenchant, only one main, two in the side. He's chosen to really go for Define Offerings, which is an interesting decision, right? I think against the Enchanter's deck, he's probably going to board in his disenchants, but I think against a lot of opponents, Divine Offering is a really good choice, right? I mean, if I look at myself, I, I enjoy playing with cards like Icy Manipulator and Gem Day Tome. They are great targets for Divine Offering because it, it destroys the artifact, but it also gives you life, and that life gain is, is quite substantial when you're destroying an artifact with casting cost four, for example, you gain four life. I mean, that's a big chunk of life and works quite well with the Sylvan Library, by the way, which is also in this deck of Gideon. So, I mean, this is looking like a really strong deck. I'm not surprised that it has reached uh, the top eight here. Gideon is also a former winner of the Camel Trophy. So I think Pater is in for a, a real, real match here. I mean, when I'm looking at this, also he's playing with all the Mox, he's playing with the Black Lotus, so he can really ramp up quickly, you know, get his powerful creatures out, get some card draw going with Sylvan Library, but also with uh, Ancestral Recall in the deck. He's playing Time Walk, which is quite good in such a creature-heavy deck. He's playing Fork. I think Fork, in my opinion, is a little bit underplayed because, you know, uh, we're playing in a playing field with so much power. There's so many players with power cards. There's so many players with restricted cards. Fork can copy them all, you know. It can can copy the Ancestral Recall. It, it, it can copy the the regrowth you know it's 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 just i think fork is is really good it's also quite good with the uh, lightning bolts underneath it by the way because you can fork a bolt you can deal six damage for three red mana if you've got the red mana that's actually quite good that can be a game decider right um like i mentioned in the introduction gideon is also playing with channel fireball so that is pretty cool he doesn't have life gain though like Peter has with his dark heart of the wood but still if there's a possibility i'm sure that he's not afraid of uh, playing his channel fireball and beating Peter with his own weapon that would be quite funny uh, but we'll just have to wait and see anyway this is the deck of gideon we've looked at the deck of Peter. that means we're ready let's go to the top eight Welcome to game number one here of the quarterfinals of the Camel Trophy in Arnhem. We have Gideon with a zoo deck on the right. He just took a mulligan. There's a balance in his hand. And then we see Peter on the left with his Enchanter's deck. He's on the play, starting with a Soul Ring and a pass. And Gideon has played the uh, City of Brass and also City of Brass here from Peter taking a damage. There's an Ancestral Recall. There's also an Ancestral Recall by Gideon. Both players still have to take their damage, though. I hope they don't forget. There, he's taking the damage. That's good. There's a Sylvan. This is looking quite good for Peter. Remember, he's playing Enchantress, so Sylvan Library is really good in an Enchantress deck. There we see a Taiga. And there is a Sylvan also by Gideon. So both players kind of doing the same. This is funny. A funny start. We do see an Enchantress there in the deck. And Peter looking at the top three cards. I do see a Fireball there. Remember, Peter has played so many uh, Channel Fireballs this tournament. It would be insane if he can win games again with that weapon. There we see an Enchantress. We are playing by Swedish rules. That's why there is no mana burn. There's a Quick Swords to Plowshares on the Enchantress. That's, of course, a good decision by Gideon. I mean, if someone plays with the Enchantress, they probably have a game plan with that card, so you want to get rid of it ASAP. Let's see if he's going to draw into some extra cards. I mean, the advantage here for Gideon is that usually when you play against uh, an, a combo-like deck, card draw deck, Enchantress deck, you don't have to worry too much about pressure. He's not taking an extra card, though. Going for an Urnum Jin. So playing the Urnum here. That means some immediate pressure. I wonder what Peter's going to do. Does he have an answer against it? Ooh, there's your answer. Control Magic taking over the Urnum. Now remember, Gideon is only playing one Disenchant main. He's chosen to go with two Divine Offerings and only one Disenchant. And like I said in the deck deck, I predict that after game one, he's going to board in his two Disenchants. Let's see if he can find an answer. I mean, it, an unanswered control magic basically means a two for one. You know, that's always huge. But I think there is a disenchant there in hand. Yeah, there we see the disenchant. So he's found that one disenchant, playing it out, getting his urn back. It does have summoning sickness again, though, taking a damage. And he's playing a regrowth over the ancestral recall. 
and passing the turn. I do think it's a good decision for him to play that uh, regrowth now because Peter was pretty much tapped out, right? He couldn't, he didn't have any blue open to potentially counter the regrowth. Now he's passing the turn. So Gideon again looking at the top three cards. Looks like he's just going to take the one. There's his Sapphire, and he's just going to go for it. He's going to play. Are we going to see a Power Sink here? There's a Power Sink. Does he have an answer to the Power Sink? No, he does not. Taking a damage from his own City of Brass. So he was taking the risk. And I'm a little bit surprised. I thought maybe he's simply going to wait until Peter again does a play where he has to tap out. But now at least Gideon knows that Peter is playing with power sinks. So that information can help him, of course, in the in the upcoming game still. This is just the first game, of course. Tapping six here. What are we going to do? Mirror Universe. This is difficult. If Gideon can now find a Divine Offering, that would be great for him. If not... It's going to be tough. One of the things that Gideon can do here is actually choose to draw an extra card. Just go to 11. Say, you know what? If you want to swap lives, go for it. So he can actually attack Peter, put him on 12, put himself on 11. That would be quite interesting. But it's always, look, that's what he does. I understand this play. But it's just, it's always tough with that mirror universe. Because you constantly have to think, what if he swaps life? Now remember, you can only use mirror universe during your upkeep. It's going to tap four. There's a Suchi. And he's going to attack here. There we see the maze activation though. So Peter's going to stay on 16. Now I wonder if Peter's going to draw extra cards. I mean, it's possible. Ooh, there we see the Fireball again. So looking at the top three cards. There's a Fireball, a land, and I couldn't see the third card. Could, of course, play this a little bit more defensively. Go Fireball on one of the creatures, for example. And how many cards has he taken? He's taken all three cards. He's going to go from 16 to 8, it seems. Wow. Does he have enough to actually burn Gideon down already to 5, 7, 9 mana? So he doesn't have enough for the Fireball. This is quite interesting. So next turn he could swap lives, I think, and he could then... Kill Gideon with a Fireball. He is going to go down to 7 because he's tapping the City of Brass. So this is risky for Gideon. If he has a Divine Offering, that would be great for him. Divine Offering on Mirror Universe, that is what Gideon right now needs. Or else he's pretty much toast. Unless he's got, of course, a Counterspell in hand. So he's now going to attack. He doesn't play with Counterspells, by the way. So he's pretty much toast attacking here. There's a bolt. Oh, there's a bolt. Is he going to win it? No, he can sack to the uh, Dark Heart of the Wood, of course. Oh, oh, oh. I think this is an oversight by Gideon. That is unfortunate. Almost had the game here. I wonder if he saw the Dark Heart because now it means pretty much game for Peter. Remember, he's got a Fireball in hand. There is another Suchi. Untap, upkeep, activation of the mirror, three for Gideon. I can see a fireball coming in the future. Those three cards don't really matter that much. Gideon tapped out. Well, one City of Brass opened, so Peter doesn't have to worry about a counterspell. There's the fireball. And it's the end here in game one. Oh, Gideon was so close. If only he could have found that divine uh, offering or if... Peter wouldn't have had the Dark Heart of the Wood. He would have won that game one. I mean, this is promising to be a really exciting match. Both players are now going to sideboard, and we're going to catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two with Gideon on the play, of course, after losing that first game. Look at that opener. Taiga and a Black Lotus in the pass. I was kind of thinking maybe a Suchi turn one. Didn't happen. Peter here opening with a Birds of Paradise. Are we going to see a Bolt the Bird? Not yet. But I'm hoping for it because I love to say it. But there's just a pass though. So there was an explosive start by Gideon. But no follow up though. Lots of cards in hand. Are we going to see an Enchantress here? Enchantress by Peter. 
And there we see a bolt on the Enchantress. So no bolt the bird, but he did bolt the Enchantress. That makes sense. And there we see a Sarah Angel here using the uh, using the Black Lotus to cast it. And there is a forest. So four mana open. Does he have a control magic again? We saw control magic in game one on the early Urnum being played by Gideon. But no control magic here. There is a Dark Heart of the Wood. But I mean, at this stage in the game, Dark Heart is not that useful. There's the attack, putting Peter on 16. And of course, Peter would have much rather played the Dark Heart with the Enchantress in play. But of course, it got bolted by Gideon. That was a really good move by him. Tapping five Fireball here on the Angel. Does mean a damage here exactly. He's going to drop to 15. And a pass. So this is a useful Fireball, I think. Can he put some more pressure on the board here? No, he cannot. Passing the turn back to Peter. Peter playing a Sylvan. And is Peter now kind of gaining the control already? There's a Disenchant on the Sylvan Library. Again, I think that's a good decision. Because he's going to use the Sylvan to try to find the Enchantress and then get his whole draw engine going. But um, it's unfortunate here for Gideon. Again, he's missing a land drop. Finally found a land. Does he have another Sari in hand? No, he does not. Just passing the turn. So I guess his hand is just full of answers. Just a land by Peter. Also a pass. And again, a pass. So both players playing quite quick at the moment. Top decking. Trying to find something. I really wonder what's in that hand. There we see a regrowth on the Sarah Angel. But there's a power sink though. No, a red elemental blast coming in from the sideboard. On the power sink. And that really works here for Gideon. What else can he do? Just passing the turn out back to Peter. Peter finding a Bayou. Two cards in hand, it seems, for Peter. I mean, if Gideon can get that Sarah Angel to stick, it's looking pretty bad again for Peter. But remember, he does, of course, have the Dark Heart of the Woods and a lot of forests there. There we see the Sarah Angel. Gideon taking a damage, dropping to 19, passing the turn. There's a control magic though. Oh, so Peter finding an answer from the top of his deck. And this is glorious for him. Stealing the angel. But I'm sh pretty sure Gideon boarded in extra disenchant. So let's see if he can find it. Of course, already played out one. I believe he had two in the sideboard. So that would means, means he plays with three. There we see the second one. Getting back the Sarah Angel. And this is pretty crucial, right? Another control magic, though. And there is a red elemental blast. Wow. So there's red elemental blast from the sideboard really doing work here for Gideon. And that's, of course, a big change. So he boarded in red elemental blast. He boarded in extra disenchants. And that actually puts him in a pretty good shape against the deck of Peter. And now he can finally swing in with the Sarah. Look at that. And Peter going to drop to 11. There's a strip mine. And there's a pass. There's a Taiga regrowth and again a control magic. So they're really battling. There's a disenchant. They're battling over this Sarah Angel. But a lot of answers here. And I believe this is the third disenchant by Gideon. So I don't think he's got any disenchants left in the deck. And Peter has now played out two control magics, I believe. Although that one was regrowth. So just one control magic. If I'm not mistaken. No two control magics, because one got disenchanted, one got red elemental blast, and one got taken back and then disenchanted. So two control magics in total. Anyway, doesn't matter that much. Here we see a mirror universe being played out and a copy artifact on the mirror universe. That is so cool. So he's saying, even if you destroy my mirror universe, it doesn't matter. Oh, look at this. Attacking, bolting, but he can sack with Dark Heart of the Woods. He's going to go to three. Going to sack a forest. I mean, that Dark Heart is doing so much work. It's just amazing. And look at this changing life totals. Gideon is now on three. Peter is in top deck mode, but he's on 19. Passing the turn here. Gideon needs five swings with his angel. Well, actually more because of the Dark Heart of the Wood. This is so, it's so difficult to kill Peter with the Dark Heart on board. There's a Soul Ring past turn. So he's not finding anything though. Oh, this is just insane. There's another angel. He's probably going to attack here, putting him on 11. 
He wants to use the strip mine, it seems. I'm not sure what you want to use it on. I would just keep it, I think, to be honest. But So he is going to use it on one of the lands, forcing him to already sack it. So he's now back, back to 14. Next turn, he can swing in for 8. That would mean he could go to 6. But he's got so many forests still left. Ooh, look at that. Ancestral Recall. This is going to be the start of a comeback. Two Glooms. They're not going to be very useful. We already have two Sarahs on the board. That is unfortunate for Peter here, finding those two Glooms. On the other hand, at least they're now out of the way. Can you imagine if he wouldn't have drawn into Ancestral Recall, but would have found Gloom 1, Gloom 2, land? You know, that's basically three turns where you take full damage. Anyway, let's see what he's going to do. There's the Birds of Paradise. I'm predicting him to just play out the Gloom. Why not? There's the Gloom. At least it's some extra attacks. I mean, it can't hurt, but it's not really the card that you're looking for in this situation. Attacking with both angels. Dropping here further and further down. And he's going to go down to six. So three for Gideon, six for Peter. This is such an interesting match. Now remember... You know, Peter still has the Dark Heart of the Wood. That is so important in this matchup. Dark Heart of the Wood, Sack of Forest, Gain 3 Life. Remember, dual lands like Tropical Island is also an island, but also a forest. Ooh, look at this. Gonna go to 2. Gonna use his Demonic Tutor. I mean, I believe he's already played out all his Disenchants, right? Has he played out the Regrowth? He could go Regrowth, Disenchant, Disenchant, Dark Heart of the Wood and just see what Pater's going to do because that's going to put Pater in a difficult position, right? Then he's got to decide, you know, am I going to now sack all my forests? Basically make it really hard for myself to cast something, but I will get a lot of life. Or, you know, what am I going to do? It is so interesting. This game is so interesting. I really wonder what he's going to pick up with this Demonic Tutor. A really exciting quarterfinals here. Yeah, he's pointing at the Dark Heart of the Wood. Every time I see somebody play with that card, I'm like, this card is nuts. It's just really, really good. And then I play with it, and all I actually end up doing is sacking my own force and losing the game with no lands in play. <laughs> but I must be doing something wrong. Anyway, Gideon really taking his time here, which makes sense. This is a quarterfinal match. The winner will continue to the semifinals. And, uh, you know, Gideon's already a game down. He knows he has to win this one. I always find it tough when I'm playing top eight and you've, you've lost that first game because, you know, even if I'm going to win it, it's a 1-1 and my opponent gets to start, which doesn't mean that he's automatically won, but it, it gives him this advantage, usually. So we'll just have to wait and see what he's going to pick up. He's really, really deep in the tank. Okay, he is going to go for that card. I really wonder what it is. I mean, is it going to be a regrowth to get back to dis disenchant? Is it that simple? Or is it something that I haven't thought of? Or is it just some kind of card draw? Is it maybe a time walk? You know, that could be quite good as well, swinging in twice with the angels. A COP red to protect him from the fireballs. Yeah, that's also a way to do it. That is also a way to do it. That makes that makes sense. I didn't even think about that. I mean, it's going to cost him more to activate it, though, because of the gloom. I mean, that could be a little bit problematic. There's extra tax coming in from the gloom. I wonder if this is going to be going to have a consequence. It looks like both players are now discussing it. And it seems like Peter is Peter's being super friendly here, allowing Gideon to, to change his mind, because I think that's actually what, what's happening here. Does that mean that he looked up the... COP red and is Peter saying oh you you didn't take gloom into account and that's okay you can look for another card remember this is old school we're very chilled 
And it's always up to the opponent, of course, to then decide if he allows it to you. Or, of course, as, as a player, if you ask for it. And that's exactly, it looks like that's exactly what's happening right now. You don't see this happen often. But it is kind of nice, you know. I think it's a really nice gesture from Peter. And he's shuffling up again. I mean, COP Red wasn't that, yeah, there's the fist bump, really respect from Gideon for allowing him to, to do this, to make this change. And, you know, I think I think COP Red would still be good. Of course, I know that, we know that Peter has a second Gloom, I think, in hand, exactly, which which would make the COP Red a lot worse. Um, but with one Gloom in play, I think COP Red would still be doable. Because you need, I mean, it is a fair point, uh, you know, Gideon does need some protection. There's a chump with the Birds of Paradise, by the way. He does need some protection from a potential fireball. I mean, a fireball would be game over instantly. There we see a Vajurn Enchantress by Peter. Peter being on six here, Gideon on two. There's the attack again, sending one back, taking, okay, chumping with the bird. So he's no longer taking any damage. There's a pass. If Peter can find, for example, a Sylvan here, he could be in a really good spot. Unfortunately for him, a land, at least it's a forest. He can untap the maze again, but he's going to use the maze, of course. Taking four, going to go down to two. What an exciting match. Both players on two, but I mean, I still think Peter's in a really good shape because of the Dark Heart of the Wood. And, you know, because of the fact that, uh, that he's got a lot of fireballs in his deck still to find. He's going to go to one. Oh, he's going to change lives. I actually like this play because it means that Gideon can no longer use his one city of brass. And is that, what card is it? Is that a fireball? He is playing out the fireball. Is he winning it here with the fireball? Or are we seeing a fireball win? It looks like he's waiting for Peter to make up his mind, deciding... How big of a fireball he wants to play. He's playing it actually for one. There's a fork. Forking the fireball. This is funny. And I think that Gideon also has a swords in hand. Changing his mind though. What is he going to do here? Oh, he's going to play a swords to plowshares. Which is super expensive because of the gloom. But this makes more sense of course. So he's going to go back up to five. Then take the damage from the fireball. He's going to go down to four. The problem, of course, here for Gideon is that now he's going to lose, exactly, he's going to lose his one flyer, so he can no longer uh, deal damage to Peter. He needs to put more pressure on the board. And remember, Gideon has to pay an extra six for every white spell. That means his Sarah Angel has now a casting cost of 11. That is insane. Oh, this is so difficult for him. What can he do? He's got a red, he's got a fork in hand, okay. Got a wheel of fortune in hand. And I believe two white cards. Maybe one of them is a sword, so I'm not quite sure. Looks like he's thinking about playing out the wheel of fortune. But I think, I think, I, I agree with Gideon not doing this because giving seven cards to your opponent, you know. There we see a time walk though. There we see a fork. So now both players take an extra turn. So basically both players don't take a turn. There's some laughing at the table. I mean, this is really, this is really like it's competitive magic, but it's friendly magic, you know, and that's what old school is all about. Like these players are very chilled, enjoying each other's plays, trying to figure out what the best ways to win are. And there's a pass again. So, I mean, at this moment, the game is a little bit stuck. And I fear here for Gideon because the longer it takes, the bigger of a chance it is for uh, for Peter to find that other fireball and decide the game. And probably if Peter would have played a fireball that's big enough, he would have won already. Then again, Gideon would have 
fork that fireball, and then it would have been interesting. You know, Peter would have to sack a lot of forests. Very interesting. Anyway, there's a pass again. Peter taking a turn, finding an island. Passing the turn here to Gideon, finding a soul ring, playing out the soul ring. Oh, he's also got a time twister there in his hand. Does that mean he's got a Wheel of Fortune and a Time Twister? I mean, that is just not useful at the moment. There is a Sylvan. Ooh, this is a problem. It means he gets to draw a card from the Enchantress. It looks like he's forgetting to draw a card. Pater, you could have drawn a card from your Sylvan. But more importantly, next turn, you've got your Sylvan online. Look at that. Fast Bond. He could go for Fast Bond. And now he's saying, I still had to draw a card, so... Again, both players being quite friendly. I can tell you, I was playing at a tournament not too long ago where I wasn't, I mean, it wasn't unfriendly, but he made he made a blocking mistake with the factory. And I was like, yeah, it's, that's, part of, that's part of the match. Um, maybe it was a little bit cruel, but I was, yeah, I was playing against one of those really good, the deck decks, and I really wanted to win. I'm sorry, but <laughs> anyway, let's. Another Enchantress here, and then fi probably followed up exactly by that Fast Bond. So he gets to draw two cards now from the Fast Bond. And what is this? There seems to be some response by Gideon. Oh, he's going to play Swords to Plowshares. And he's got to tap so much because of the Double Gloom. So now he only gets to draw one card. I think this is a good decision by Gideon, but, you know... It's looking really bad for him. Okay, here we see a clone. I wonder what he's going to clone. That's always annoying because I don't have audio at the moment. So, just going to have to wait and see. I mean, he could consider blocking, uh, cloning a Sarah Angel, trading the Sarahs. He could also consider, uh, of course, cloning the Fajurian Enchantress. But, I mean, maybe in this position you want to clone the Sarah instead. Another option could be actually to clone the Urnum. Then again, Urnum bounces off Urnum. It's interesting. Every choice has an argument for it and against it. I think in this position, I would go for Sarah Angel, trade Sarah Angels. Let me know in the comments below what you would do. And look at that, Gideon is going to go through his graveyard. Does that mean that he's got a regrowth or a recall or something? Or is he thinking about playing his Time Twister, shuffling back in the graveyards? That would be kind of suicide, so I don't think he's going to do that. Then again, he's kind of stuck at the moment as well. If he could like draw into a perfect 7 and hope that Peter kind of whiffs. But I, I, I don't see Gideon doing that, to be honest. There are more creatures on the board here. There's another Urnum Jin. Ooh, is he gonna do it? Is he gonna do it? Is he gonna play a Time Twister? No, he's not. He's like, do, am I gonna do it? Am I not gonna do it? The problem here for Gideon is that Dark Heart of the Wood. If the Dark Heart of the Wood wouldn't be there, he could win just by finding one of his Lightning Bolts. But the fact is that the Dark Heart of the Wood is on the table. It's been there for a while. Oh, man. There's also a balance in hand for Gideon, a card that he can't really do anything with. It would be great if, if Gideon could find a way to kind of destroy his own lands and then play the balance. There is the Time Twister. He's doing it. Oh, man, I like this move, but it's a risky move. But I love it, Gideon, because now we're going to see it, it's, it, you know, you're both going to draw into a fresh seven. It is super risky. And Gideon knows this, but he's like, you know what? I got to take a chance. I'm losing the way it is, you know, with the Enchantress in the game, the Sylvan in the game, the Dark Heart in the game. I'm going to lose it. So at least with a fresh seven, if I have that perfect hand, maybe find a time walk now, you know, then... You know, he's, he's got a chance. Maybe Disenchant. Yes. Then again, Disenchant is super expensive because of the double gloom. Oh, I see a Mox Jet there in hand of Gideon. So he's going to play it out. 
I mean, there's there's a pretty big chance he's gonna die next turn, but let's wait and see. There is a plateau. Counting the amount of mana that he has. There's a swords in his hand. It's one of the cards that I can identify. I think that's... Is that a black card next to the swords or not? It's hard to see. Now remember, Gideon is already down a game. He has to win this one to stay into the top eight match. Both players playing here for the semifinals, right? And their chance of actually winning the Camel Trophy. There he is, a Swords to Plowshares. And he's going to take care of the clone. And, and looking at the amount of life that he's getting, I think he actually cloned the Sarah Angel. Going to go up to six. Attacking here, chum blocking the Urnum. And he really doesn't want to start sacking the forests, it seems. I'm a little bit surprised by this chump here by Peter because for Journey Enchantress is so important for his deck. I thought maybe he would rather sack, you know, a forest and chump. But maybe he has his, oh, his own reasons. I mean, I, I cannot see what's in his hand. I don't know his deck. Maybe he's already got a fireball in hand. Remember, he had that full seven from the Time Twister. Maybe he's got another. Oh, there's Demonic Tutor. Is it already over? Look at that. He's tapped out. Given the hand, he's gonna probably look up a fireball and win it here. Oh man, but this game too was very entertaining. And I wanna thank both players. Also, it's really nice to see that uh, that sportsmanship. Uh, I absolutely love it. Uh, well done. And Peter, Peter, it's insane, but you're gonna continue with your Fridurn Enchantress deck. I'm gonna say it again, his Fridurn Enchantress deck to the top four of the Camel Trophy. Now, if you wanna see that top four match, Make sure to tune into Timmy Talks again next week because then I'll be back with more action from this tournament. And if you enjoyed what you see, please consider hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. And if you're already a subscriber yet, thank you so much. Please take a moment to like, share, and comment on this video. These are three easy actions to take and they're all free, but they really help Timmy Talks move forward. Talking about moving forward, I also have my very own Patreon page. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And, uh, and find out how you can support me as a content creator. It already starts for $1 a month. And for that measly dollar, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. Um, you can join in the Timmy Talks online tournaments and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Somebody can see.